Hey friends, thanks for checking out the Awaken Church YouTube channel. We hope that the ministry of Awaken Church is a blessing to you. We have two goals for the sermon today. Number one, we want you to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two, we want you to grow closer in your walk with Him. And so we're so excited that you are taking the time to jump into our message. If you're blessed by the ministry, we'd love to ask you to give online. You can go to myawaken.org and click on give and invest into the ministry. And we believe God's going to bless you for that. We can't wait to share the word with you today. So jump right in. Pray you're blessed by the ministry. God bless you. Well, as they are receiving the offering today, I, uh, we're going to jump into the word. I was, if, if, you, if you weren't here last week, I was actually not here either. I was, my family and I were on vacation last week and uh, so glad to be back. Didn't Pastor Tim do an amazing job last week? Those of you that were here, absolutely love him. My only, the only reason I hated scheduling him when I was out of town is that I didn't get to be here when he was here because truly I love, I love his preaching. I love him as a person, but honestly, I love hanging out with him. He's just, he's just a good dude. And so I uh, love him and his family and so grateful that they were able to be here. But we've been in a series called What Now? And the context of this series is talking about what are our next steps after we've received Jesus. What does discipleship look like? Because that's what the whole point of it is. The verse that we read the first week is that Jesus said, Go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The word disciple literally means to, to be an exclusive follower of the teachings of a master. And that's we're following Jesus. We're listening to his teachings exclusively. So this whole series has been about steps that we can take to better follow Jesus. The first week we talked talked about baptism, and then we had folks get baptized. And the next week, we talked about the Bible and the fact that one of the best things you can do to grow in your Christian faith is to learn who Jesus is, read his word, spend time in his word. Then last week, Pastor Tim talked about bold obedience. And today, I got a message for you that I just need to, I need to let you know that as a pastor, I'm on a soapbox today. And I told first service, I'm probably going to make everybody in the room mad at me before the service is over. So just, this is your forewarning. I love you, but you're going to be mad at me today. So just, just be ready. Because today, we're talking about one of the best things that you can do to further yourself in discipleship. We've talked about baptism. We've talked about the Bible. We've talked about bold obedience. Today, we're talking about be here. Be here. We're talking about church attendance this morning. Aren't you glad you chose today to come to church? I, uh, I was thinking about, I don't know if you remember this a couple years ago, this crazy thing happened and uh, there was this sickness that people started getting and uh, about March of 2020, I don't know if you guys remember this time at all, um, that the entire world shut down. I specifically, you know, there are some things that happen in history that everybody's like, do you remember where you were when, you know, when this happened? I can still remember the moment that I knew COVID-19 was like not just, you know, not just a story that was kind of going to come and go. It was a Wednesday night. I had preached a youth service at our church. I got home and I got a notification on my phone from ESPN that the Oklahoma City Thunder had, caught, had canceled their game because somebody had tested positive that was in the crowd. And it was like, that was at like 8.30 at night. By 2 o'clock the next day, the whole world was like, we're done. We're out. We're shutting down. Everything was shut down. Now I'm going to tell you why that was ultimately, obviously, I don't want to belittle what the pandemic was. Obviously, there was a lot of people, everybody, I think, was affected in loss in some way, shape, or form during that season. And so I don't want to belittle that at all. So please don't mishear my tone today as I'm talking. But I'm going to tell you one of the reasons that I was so upset when all this happened, because it was March of 2020. Now, I am a sports fanatic. In particular, I am a college basketball sports fanatic. March is the absolute worst time for a world pandemic to take place. If they would have asked me when the world pandemic should happen, I would have said, can we wait until the middle of April so we can get through the final four and figure out who the national champion is? I'm a huge Kentucky fan. That year, we had a great team. We had kind of found our stride. We were hot going into the SEC tournament. They canceled the SEC tournament. I thought, man, that's a bummer, but at least we got the NCAAs next week. Nope, just kidding. They canceled that too. The entire season was over. Sports were done. 
Now, how many of y'all know that ESPN still had to find programming during that time? And so I, can't, I watched some cornhole tournaments. I watched some rugby matches. I learned what lacrosse was. I didn't even know. I just, they were playing all kinds of stuff on ESPN during that season. But around June, I think it was, June or July, that the NBA figured out, we got to figure out how to get some revenue back. Because ain't nobody paying no money to go to games that aren't happening. We're not getting TV contracts for games that aren't happening. And so they came up with the idea, let's take every team, every coach, every player, and let's put them all at Disney World in an isolated hotel, and they're going to play in what they called the bubble. And so the NBA bubble season was about to happen. And man, they were pushing this TNT, ESPN. Everybody was advertising everything because the bubble, like, like basketball is back. And I'm gonna be honest with you. I was so thirsty for some sports that I was excited about the bubble season. I was like, let's go. So first game happens. I'm, I'm pulled up on my couch. I got my food. I got my drink because this is, the sports have been gone for like four months. Finally, they're back. I can celebrate this. And so I turn it on, Tip game tips off. The first dunk happens, and I realize this is different. Because you see, what happens is when somebody throws down, like they just, they, they dunk face on somebody and they post right. When there's 30,000 people in the room, it goes nuts. And the television companies figured out that if you mic the crowd, it makes the experience better for the viewer. And so when there's a dunk and they go, ah, and all of us, are, we, we feel it at home. And we either get really excited or we throw something at the TV because it was our team that got dunked on and we get mad about it because that's what happened. So when we're watching the bubble season, they dunked and there were 20 people in the entire arena. And so they dunked and they said, they dunked and you heard 12 voices in the distance. Yeah. It wasn't the same. They hit three, like, I, I, I don't know if, if I'm, I'm nerding out a little bit or telling you what you don't care about, but there was one particular game in the playoffs that year that Luka Doncic hit a fadeaway three as time expired. And in like real life, People going to go nuts. He hits it, and his team runs and, like, tackles him. And it was the most anticlimactic thing ever because, like, there's nobody in the room. There are some things that are just better when you're in the room. There are some things that are just not the same when you're not in the room. Now, I get that there is a lot of access to a lot of things in 2023. You can listen to a, like some killer worship music at the touch of a button. I mean, you got Spotify, you got Apple Music, you got YouTube. You can get all this stuff. You can hear some amazing stuff. You can hear some of the best preachers, not just of our time, but you can hear preachers from history. You can go back and find sermon. I love to go back and find some like old school, like, like old school sermons, like from T.D. Jakes before he was T.D. Jakes and Rod Parsley from back in like 1980s and Juanita Bynum and R.W. Shambach. I like to find some of these guys and, and G.E. Patterson, listen to some of them preaching from back in the day. I love to do that. But as good as it is to watch it on a screen, there is just something about being in the room. It's not the same. There are some things that were not meant to be enjoyed on a screen. Let me, let me read scripture to you. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So let's think about each other, how we're going to stir up love and good works. How are we going to do that? By not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. How are we going to help each other do good? How are we going to help each other, encourage one another, come to church? Again, aren't you glad that you came to church today to hear about why you need to come to church? Honestly, if you're going to miss a sermon, this was the one that you wanted to be in the room because I can't, like, if you watch it on YouTube later, you don't get convicted because you were here. So it's all good. We live in a different time, even than we did four years ago. Like, the world is different now. Even since all, I mean, we've, we've come through the pandemic, and, and I, I think this last week even the, the, the World Health Organization said that we're, we're out of the woods on all, like, I, I get all that. But things are not the same. The world is not the same. Like, that year, those two years forever changed the reality of our society. And what happened was when, 
when the pandemic first hit and churches everywhere, businesses everywhere shut down because we didn't know what to do. I, I mean, I was, I was a part of staff meetings that we were talking about. What are we going to do? We had one staff meeting that literally we're like, we're, we ain't shutting down. And then the next staff meeting, we're like, well, I, I guess we're going to shut down. Like, I mean, it was, this, this was the, the, the tension that everyone was feeling in every sector. And so mostly, almost without fail, there were a couple of small churches that still had gatherings, but most churches stopped having public gatherings for at least a season. And they said, jump online, watch online. And, and we all, it's, it's so embarrassing to remember, we were all like, the church has left the building. Like, you know, like we thought this was so clever. It wasn't clever. It was, it was a terrible time. Anyways, people were watching everything online, which was fine to get us through that season. The problem was when the church opened back up, people had figured out, I can drink my coffee in bed and watch the sermon. Like, I can sit on my porch and be in worship. And so when the church opened back up, there were a lot of churches that were like, where'd half our church go? Because they ain't back yet. Now, a lot of the a lot of surveys have said, you know, that that we're back. Churches are back to pre-COVID attendance. We aren't because we didn't exist before COVID. So you know, that's we don't have those numbers yet because they didn't exist. But one thing that that happened is is before COVID in 2019, the average church attender, according to Barner Research, the average church attender that was a faithful quote unquote faithful church attender came to church once every four weeks. That was the average church attender. So Pew Research just released a survey this year that says that that number has gone from once every four weeks to once every six weeks. Is what the average faithful church attender says they come to church. Now, if you're around me very long, you're going to find out that I'm, I was raised old school. And I, I, try to, I try to paint over it a little bit to not look old school, but I'm, I'm old school. I'm, I'm a very old. Because here was, here was the frequency with which we went to church when I was growing up. We went with the, the whenever the door is open mentality. Like if the door was unlocked and somebody was preaching, my family was there. Not just our church. Like I went to my church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, prayer meeting on Saturday night. We'd go to revival somewhere Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Like, we lived in the church. We lived in church. It was something that, that we valued. And the thing is that I know my family was probably weird and exceptional in that way. But, like, if you go back 70 years, even in, like, in the 1950s, 1960s, there was this mentality amongst American society that on Sunday morning, you went to church. You just did. Like, it doesn't matter if you're Baptist, Episcopalian, Pentecostal, whatever. Like, you're going to be in church somewhere. But that context that said you're going to be in church every single Sunday over the course of 70 years has gone from every single Sunday to now once every six weeks. My question to you is this, because this is just the way my brain works, is to ask this question. Did church attendance get less important during those 70 years? Let me just answer that real quick. No, it didn't. The value and the priority of being in the house of God did not diminish in those 70 years. What changed was the priorities of the people of God. What changed was the priorities of our society. Because now the reason, can I tell you, I know we're all busy. I get it. I, I, believe me. My family, I, it's like we turn around. It's, we, we'll leave here today and we'll blink and it's Saturday night and I'm getting ready for church on Sunday morning again. Like it's crazy. I get we are all so busy. But the truth is that the reason that we don't come to church is not because we're too busy. It's because we prioritized other things. It's because we've given our time to other things to the degree that when it's Sunday morning, we say, well, I'm just too tired to go to church. But I'm going to tell you why you're too tired to go to church. Because you made church a Sunday morning decision. Church attendance is not a Sunday morning decision. It's a Friday night plan. I, I, got, I got one amen over here. I'm going to go over to this side because you said amen, Sister Teresa. I'm going to preach to you for a minute. Because what needs to happen is the, the way we structure our sat. Now I get that I'm, I'm a full-time employee of the church. So you're probably like, well, that's because you're a pastor. But when I wasn't a pastor, my Saturdays were structured around my Sundays. I mean, 
listen, if you want to go get dinner with me, we ain't doing it on Saturday night. Because I'm going to be home. Not necessarily because I'm going to bed, because I don't go to bed early anyways. But I ain't doing nothing that's going to get me tired on Sunday. Because I believe there's value in being in the house of the Lord. I believe there's still something special about getting in and worshiping together with other believers. It's valuable to be in the house of God. 33% of Christ followers, one third, are the only ones that would even say, I'll go once out of every six weeks. 33%. That's a crazy number to me. Church attendance rates have dropped because our priorities have changed. We value rest more than we value worship. And so I, I'm going to tell you what I found out. Listen, I need to give you this disclaimer because I grew up in, around preachers that, that didn't believe in uh, any kind of therapy or self-care or any of that. I need you to know I'm not that guy. Like, I believe in, in professional care. I believe in therapists. I believe Christian therapists. Let me insert that. I believe in spirit-filled Christian therapy. Don't be going to no secular therapist that's going to affirm you for whatever you believe about yourself. Go to somebody that's going to go to the Word of God and direct you into truth because going deeper into deception is not going to help you. You need somebody that's going to direct you into truth. So I'm not, I'm not talking about not taking care of ourselves. But I'm going to tell you the problem is, is that the church has done this pendulum swing to where we were all about spirituality and all, all about didn't consider self-care. That now we've swung it back to where we worship at the altar of self-care. And so if you're too tired, don't, you don't need to go to church. What is that? I'm too tired to worship? I'm too tired to walk in my purpose. I'm too tired to serve the kingdom. I'm not too tired to get up and go to work on Monday when there's a paycheck on the line. I, I, I'm not too tired to lay in bed till 3 o'clock in the morning and binge watch Netflix. I'm going to tell you something. There is not a person in this room that is not worshiping on a weekly basis. You're just choosing to allocate your worship in other places. When you, be, when you begin to prioritize other things over the house of God, your worship is not going unused. It is going misrepresented. You're putting it in other areas that it does not deserve. There are things that are receiving your worship because they're getting your time and they're getting your talent and they're getting your energy. And so when you say I'm too tired, what you really mean is that my worship bank has been depleted to the degree that I have nothing to give to the house of God today. It is a weekly decision that on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I am depending and saying, you know what? I know we got plans. They want to get together, but we're going to have to do it some other time than Sunday because on Sunday morning, I'm going to be in the house of God because my God is still worthy of worship and praise. We value rest over worship. These are just some observations that I have as the reasons that we don't necessarily prioritize church attendance. The second thing is that we see church attendance as benevolence. In other words, this is our mentality. And listen, I, told, I ain't always been a pastor, so you think I'm preaching at you. I'm preaching to me and how I thought, and I just, you, you might think that way now too. So if you do, I'm sorry. I didn't mean this personally. But we think, man, that church, they are lucky that I'm coming today. I mean, we even say in our, in our welcome moment, a lot of times we're like, we know there's a lot of the places you could be today. And you're like, you know what? You're right. You are blessed that I have chosen to grace you with my presence in this house today. Do you understand what we're subtly doing? Even, even though we might not be as exuberant as to say, what we're subtly doing is we are setting up an altar to the almighty me. And I'm coming today to worship God, but God is lucky that I'm in the house. I'm going to tell you something. This is the reality. And this, it's hard for me to preach this as a, pa as a pastor because truly I need you to know that I'm not, I'm not just blowing smoke up here when I say that I do honor the fact that you, I like, I, it means so much to me that you're here. So know that that's my heart. But also, this is the truth of the matter. God is not lucky that I'm here. God is not lucky that you're here. I am so blessed and I am so fortunate 
that God in his sovereignty and in his will has established there would be a house of worship in Cartersville, Georgia. And as he was looking for those that would make that happen and that would serve on those teams and that would worship in those seats, he saw fit in his sovereignty to write into my story a connection to be able to come into this room and worship him with a gathering of believers like you. And so the church isn't lucky that I'm here. I'm lucky the church is here. I'm a benef- I am a beneficiary of the will of God that he created this space for us to come together and worship. We have an amazing opportunity every single Sunday morning. Do you realize there are people in foreign countries that would be absolutely astounded to find out that we use the government entity called the United States Postal Service to send a flyer to every single mailbox in Cartersville to tell them, hey, we're opening a church On a Sunday morning, we want you to come. It would blow their minds that the government is sending these posters to people because what happens in their country is if the government catches you with a Bible, in the best case, you get put in a uh, relocation camp, and, and in the worst case, you get killed on the spot. And so the fact that we're publicly saying, hey, come here, we're gonna worship Jesus together. Come here, we're gonna read the scriptures together. They would say, that is crazy. You are so lucky. But you and I say, well, you know, honestly, I only got six hours of sleep last night, so I'll catch them next week. What a spectrum of mentalities. And I'm so grateful. Listen, we we bellyache about this country all the time. Whatever side of the spectrum you fall, whether you Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, whatever, we all argue about it. Can I tell you, we are so blessed that we live in a country that we can wake up on Sunday morning and say, I don't know if I want to go to church or not. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. How blessed are we? How blessed are we that, that we have these conversations? But it would blow their minds. We have such an amazing opportunity Every single Sunday. I want to simplify why church attendance takes place. Like, why are we here? What is it that we do? Because ultimately, everything that happens here falls within three categories. We're doing three things every single time we gather. Number one, we're worshiping God together. Number two, we're learning from his word. And number three, we're seeking after him in prayer. That's why we gather corporately. We worship together, we learn about God, we seek him in prayer. And ultimately we share the gospel, but a part sharing the gospel is ultimately just inviting others into that process of worshiping God together, learning his word, seeking after him in prayer. Everything we do, every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, every small group that'll be launched, everything that happens will be based on those three things. Worshiping God together, learning from his word, seeking after him in prayer. And so those are the things that we do corporately. Now I already hear The person in the room that says, well, pastor, I can do all three of those things on my own time. I can worship God, seek after him in prayer, and learn from his word while I sit in my deer stand. I can worship God, learn his word, seek after him in prayer while I walk around the outlet malls. I can worship God, seek after him in prayer, and learn from his word while I sleep in until 1130 on Sunday morning. Like, I can do all of that on my own time. But the thing is, the reason why church attendance is so important and why I'm preaching it so passionately is because it wasn't my idea. I ain't the one who said it's necessary. Now, I ain't going to lie to you. I'm a pastor of a church that we planted. It is a benefit to me that you are in the room. I preached this message last night with nobody in the room, and it's going a lot better today than it did then. (laughs) Y'all are a much more responsive crowd than these chairs were. And so I'm glad that you're here, but I need to tell you it was not my idea for you to be here. Acts chapter 2, verse number 1, the birth of the church, the day of Pentecost that took place. This is is when the the Holy Spirit went public. He went from just being that Jesus had and something that he had given to his disciples, a small crowd, and he literally went public to where everybody that believed on Jesus had access to the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse number 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, Here's the verse. They were all in one accord in one place. When Jesus was, now I'm going to tell you something. I don't get invited to the strategy meetings in heaven. But if I had been invited to the strategy meeting of heaven, when they said, how are we going to release the Holy Ghost to the world? I'd have said, well, Jesus, you can station 
one of the disciples over here in this corner. You could put one over here. You could put one in Jerusalem. You could put one in Asia. You could put one in countries that ain't been. You could put one everywhere. Strategically, it makes sense that if you're going to fill all these people, that you're going to place them and then fill them. But heaven's strategy was that before I send my people out to win the world, I'm going to get them together to fill them up. And so the Holy Spirit wasn't released on the world until it had been released in one place. And I'm going to tell you something. God does want to move in your cubicle section. God does want to move in your subdivision. God does want to move at the place that you work and in the circle of influence that you have. But the way the Holy Spirit showed up is still the way that he moves today. He wants to meet with a group of people that would say, we're getting together in one place with one mindset to get filled up so that what I receive in the one place, I can take to my place. And I can become an outlet and ambassador for heaven because I came to one place and I got filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He moved in one place. So, while I don't want to make it all about us, I've already told you that, that humanism is a real problem in our culture, in our mindsets. I do want to finish out the sermon today by telling you that coming to church does add value to your life. Does it, does it cost? Does it mean I got to get up earlier? Do I, listen, I'm the pastor and I don't want to get out of bed on Sunday mornings. I get it. But I'm going to tell you, it adds value. I want to tell you three ways it adds value. Number one, there is something about synergy. There's something about when people get together for the same reason. Now, when I was going through the, the training to plant the church and reading all the things that we got to read, and one of the things they tell us is like, you got to make it easy for people. Everything that you do, you got to make sure that your marketing is easy to understand. You got to make sure that you're telling them exactly what you want them to do, giving them a clear call to action. When they come onto your campus, they need to be able to understand where they need to go and what they need to do, where to drop their kids, all that stuff. And so we did our best to make that, the, especially at the school, like because we were transforming an elementary school into a church every week. We went to a lot of trouble to make sure there was signage and there was all these. So like we did our best to do that. But I'm going to tell you something that I discovered is that the church is about the only place that really does that. Because like I had somebody give me some tickets to a Braves game last year and uh, I drove up, got off the exit. Uh, of, of 75 there, got off the exit by, the, by Truist Park. Number one, I paid $25 to park a half a mile away. Wasn't nobody there with a vest on saying, hey, come this way to come to the Braves game. Wasn't nobody saying this is what, like, I parked there and I got out of my car and I started walking, hoping I was walking in the right direction. And then I talked to Prophetess Siri and she told me exactly where I needed to walk to. And so, but I, I, I'm walking, I'm trying to find it. I get there. And when I, when I show up outside the gate, they didn't have nobody smiling saying, we're so glad you're here today. What they had was people that was making about $10 an hour that hated their life that was saying, take everything out of your pocket, put it in this bucket and hope nothing beeps when you walk through this metal detector because I don't want to be here and you want to be here, so come on through. So I get through and I'm going to tell you something. When I got in that place, they sure enough was not giving me no free coffee. I'll tell you that wasn't happening when I walked in the door. When I walked to the concession stand, I said, I'll take a bottle of water. They said, okay, that'll be $4,000. And I said, okay, all right. Well, let me take out a second mortgage so I can have a hot dog. And so there, there, was, there was no consideration about making it easy for me. There was no consideration about making sure that it was convenient for me. But I wasn't the only person in that stadium. In fact, when I went and sat down in my seat, there were 30,000 other people that had gone through the same things that I had gone through, that was paying the same inflated cost for hot dogs and water, that was, that was doing the same stuff, parking in the same places. And I figured out the reason why the first time Ronald Acuna, Acuna hit a home run. Because when he hit that home run and 30,000 voices stood up, clapped their hands, and screamed together, there was something that took place because 30,000 people got in synergy together and it created an atmosphere that I said, all right, I'll pay 25 bucks for parking. I'll pay for the hot dog. I'll pay for the ticket. I'll go through the metal. I'll do all the things. Because there's something about synergy. Now, I get 
that you probably had to do some work to get here this morning. I get you didn't want to get up and shower and get dressed. I I get you didn't want to get your kids ready and get them checked into kids ministry. But there's something about when you get in this room and you've gone through stuff all week long and you've been facing trouble at work and trouble at home and trouble here and there. But then we start singing, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. We start saying, let us become more aware of your presence. And something shifts in the atmosphere when a group of people begin to get in synergy, begin to get together in unity in one accord and seek after the presence of God because there is something about synergy. I'm going to tell you, I'm thankful for the move of God that I can have driving in my car on the way to work. I'm thankful that he'll meet me in my bedroom. But I'm going to tell you something. A Tuesday morning experience in his presence is not meant to be a replacement for what he does on Sundays because there's still something powerful about the corporate body of believers coming together and worshiping in synergy. There's something about Synergy. So I, I, I get it. Every person in here has had something they faced this week. Probably most of us yelled at our kids on the way to church. You might have had a, had a fight with your spouse before you walked in the door. You might have had a bill that you didn't expect this week. You might have had an alternator go out. You might have had a flat tire. You might have thought you were going to pay, get a paycheck that you didn't get. You've had all this stuff. But for just a few moments, for an hour and 15 minutes, we come together and we don't think about the fights with our kids. We don't think about the fights with our spouse. We don't think about the alternator that's broken. We don't think about the washer that we got to replace. But for just a few minutes, we get together and we start saying, man, God is good. My life may be bad right now, but God is good. The God that I serve is able. He's capable. He's worthy. And for just a few minutes, we get in synergy to seek after him. And so I I don't know about you, but I ain't going to let a headache keep me out of my healing. I I ain't going to let being a little tired on a Sunday morning keep me from getting in the place where with my other fellow believers, we can declare the goodness of God and feel an atmospheric shift that changes things in my life. I'm not going to let something keep me from that. And I hear some of y'all, you're like, well, pastor, I, I wouldn't do that either. I ain't, I ain't staying home because of no headache. I ain't staying home because I'm tired. But the thing that I've figured out, you know, we've been, we've been going for about a year and a half now. And God has blessed us in the last year, especially last six months, especially with growth. And many of you are new. And so I'm thankful. I'm going to tell you one of the things that I found out. One of the biggest problems that we have as a church is the fact that people come here. And, uh, and the thing that I've figured out with people is that wherever there's people, there's problems. Wherever there's people, there's somebody getting their feelings hurt. Wherever there's people, there's somebody seeing a Facebook post. There's somebody commenting on an Instagram picture. There's somebody talking about somebody. And so you say, I'd never stay home and miss my healing because of a headache, but I I will miss my blessing because of some bitterness. And so I I loved that church until I figured out that there were some people in there that weren't perfect. I loved that church until they didn't meet my every expectation. And so now I ain't going to go no more. Because remember, they were blessed for me to be there in the first place. So if they ain't going to bless me, I ain't about to bless them. I'm going to let bitterness keep me from my blessing. I'll let some gossip keep me out of his glory. I, I'm going I'm to just stay away. Let me give you a hard word today. Put on your boots. This is a hard word. If people can keep you out of the house of God, you weren't coming for the right reason in the first place. You see, if your opinion keeps me from worshiping, then I was worshiping your opinion. Because the only thing that can withhold my worship is the one to whom I'm offering it. And so I can offer him my worship and you can think I'm an absolute idiot. It don't bother me at all because I ain't here for you. I ain't worshiping you. I ain't singing to you. I ain't clapping for you. You can say it don't take all that. That don't matter. I didn't ask you if it took all that because I'm bringing my praise to him. And you might see me now and think I'm crazy, but you didn't see me when I was addicted to pornography and he broke the chains off my life. You didn't see where he brought me from to understand why my praise gets a little bit passionate. 
See, you'd understand why I get so passionate if you saw my been through. If you knew what he had brought me out of, you'd understand why I'm worshiping him. And so that's why I don't get real concerned whether you like me or not. I hope you do. I hope that you enjoy your time here. But I didn't plant this church for you. I didn't plant this so you'd come. I planted this because the one that I am passionately in love with said, this is what I want you to give birth for me. And so I said, God, here's my worship. Here's my praise. If the opinion of people keeps you from worshiping, then you're not here for the first place, not here for the right reason in the first place. So why are we here? Why do we come together? Because scripture tells us to. But when we do, I love this psalm. It says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Something powerful happens. when We begin to magnify him together and exalt him together. Well, Pastor Tyler, how do you magnify the Lord. You can't make him no bigger. He's God. It don't get no bigger than God. To magnify means to make bigger. When I magnify the Lord, I don't make him bigger in reality. I make him bigger in my perspective. Because all of us got a magnifying glass. And a lot of times what we do is we take our little problem, we whip out our magnifying glass, and we say, whoo! Now that is a big problem. (laughs) I don't know what you're dealing with, but look at how big my problem is. And we try to get everybody else to see our problem through our magnifying glass. What happens when we magnify the Lord together is that we take the magnifying glass off of our problem and we turn it on to our God. And I used to see my problem. I used to see the bills that I have that I don't know how I'm going to pay and I magnify. But now I turn them on to the God that provides all of my needs according to his riches and glory. And as I magnify the Lord, I used to see the sickness and the prognosis. But then I turn my magnifying glass on him and I see that by his stripes we were healed. And I can't help but exalt him and magnify him because I'm shifting my perspective off of my problem and onto the goodness of the God that I serve. And when that happens, the atmosphere changes. And that atmosphere that's produced is because of a relocated intentionality. So here's how I wrote down. The manifest presence of God is the result of a relocated awareness of reality. Because when his presence manifests, it's not because a lot of times, I, and I get the way, I, I get how creatives work because I'm, I'm like a closet creative, okay? I don't, I don't like, I'm not like, a hipster creative, but like I'm, I'm, I'm a creative person. And so I get how creatives work and the way their minds work. And so I hear these worship writers that write songs like, when you walk in the room and, and all these things, like I get, I get it. But he ain't never walked in a room except for Jesus. He walks through, like you get what I'm saying? I'm saying the presence of God now, the presence of the Holy Spirit has never walked into a room because he fills every room. He's omnipresent. He has never entered into a space because he has always inhabited that space. And so when we're saying, would you move in? He's like, bro, like, I'm here. That's why I love that song that it says, let us become more aware of your presence. Not would you send us your presence. Would you just help me to take my awareness off of the deadness that I'm in and become aware of the presence of an almighty God that is in the room to change the situation? The manifest presence of God. So there's something about synergy. My worship changes my perspective. Ultimately, this is the big idea of that point, is that a shift of perspective is one of the most beneficial byproducts of church attendance. I have come to church, I can't tell you how many times I've come, I've come to church feeling a certain way and left feeling completely different. Yeah. Not because the situation resolved itself, but because as I worship, my perspective shifted. Yeah. My reality was changed. The second thing, there's something about synergy. The second thing is that your struggle might be my story. What you're going through, the thing that you're facing might be something that I've gone through. One of the enemy's best lies is he loves to convince you that you are an exceptional sinner. There ain't nobody can sin like you, brother. There ain't nobody ever dealt with alcoholism to the degree that you are. There ain't nobody ever been addicted to pornography as bad as you are. 
Ain't, ain't nobody ever had a mouth that cussed like a sailor quite like you, my brother. Nobody. He convinces you that you're exceptionally sinful. And he makes you think that you're the only one that has ever walked through the particular season that you're walking through. And in doing so, he causes us to begin to lose hope because if nobody else has been through it, then maybe I ain't going to get through it. But your struggle might be my story. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. What's the apostle saying? He's saying literally every battle you're facing, somebody else has faced. Every temptation you're going through, somebody else has gone through it. Every struggle you're walking in, someone else has walked in that same struggle. And so here's my encouragement to you today. No matter what sin you're facing, no matter what struggle you're going through, no matter how broken you feel, you are not the only one. You're not the only one. Somebody else has been there. Now, I don't do this often in preaching in that I don't, I don't leave the effectiveness of an illustration to the participation of the audience. But I, I felt led to do this as I was preparing this sermon. And so I, we, we, are, we are a church that is built on the mantra of authenticity. We say we're a real, we are real people with real problems offering real hope. We're not trying to be fake. We're not trying to convince you of nothing. And so with that in mind, I'm going to need some folks to be authentic today. I'm going to need you to be authentic and real today. So what I want you to do, is I'm going to list some stuff here. And what I want you to do is if you've dealt with that in your life, I want you to stand. If you're in this room today and you've ever struggled with alcoholism, I want you to stand. If you're in this room today and you've ever struggled with drug addiction, I want you to stand. If you're in this room today and you've ever struggled with depression, I want you to stand. If you're in this room today and you've ever struggled with pornography addiction, I want you to stand. You ever struggle with anxiety, I want you to stand. You ever struggle with any kind of sexual perversion, same-sex attraction, gender identity issues, whatever that is, whatever the case may be, I'm not going to label it in one particular thing, but any kind of sexual perversion, I want you to stand. I want you to look around this room right now. Because what happens is, is when we come to church on a Sunday, we see everybody got their shower, they got their hair done, they got their nice clothes on, and we think, man, ain't nobody broken like me. Look around this room. Because every person in here has a story. And our testimony is not, I'm perfect and I've never done nothing. Our testimony is, my God is a savior. My God is a deliverer. My God is a breaker of chains. And so if you're in this room today, if you're in this room today and you are currently walking through some of those issues that, I'm that I talked about, you're currently facing those things, look around because your struggle is their story. What you're going through is what they have walked through. Why does that matter? Because when you look around and you see them, a lot of us are talking about the things we struggled with in the past tense. And we're here to testify that though you feel the hopelessness of your present, there is an after. There is a moment that you walk out of the darkness and you understand that God is able to set you completely free. To those of you that have stood for any of those reasons, I grew up in a church culture that taught us, even it wasn't intentional, but they taught us when you get saved, you make sure nobody ever knew who you used to be. And I, we don't want to glory in the past. That's not what I'm telling you to do. I'm not telling you to brag about how many drugs and all the, about how many women and all. I'm not telling you about none of that. That's not what I'm saying. but don't discount the power of your testimony. We are made overcomers by the blood of the lamb, but do you understand it says, and by the word of our testimony. 
In other words, my over this isn't even in my notes. Holy Spirit has dropped it. My overcoming is found because of our testimony. How? I'm able to overcome when I found out that you've been where I am and you came through it. And so I'm thankful for the blood of the Lamb, but sometimes I just need to know that I'm not the first one that has fought this giant. I just need to know that I'm not the first one that has had to dig through this miry clay and come out of it. I'm made an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb, but I'm encouraged by the word of our testimony as a corporate gathering. When we say, we've been there, we've gone through that, you can make it. Do you understand how much of the Christian experience is based upon a corporate encouragement and exhorting of one another? Even today, the current ministry of the saints, Hebrew tells us, is that they beckon us on. They're encouraging us. You can make it. You can get there. You can overcome. You can be free. If you're not already, already standing, I want you to stand with me. There's something about synergy. My struggle could be your story and thirdly the third value add that church attendance gives you is that there is a solution to isolation what happens is when we feel broken and we feel dirty and we feel like we're the only ones that have ever gone through what we're going through is we tend to pull away and hide don't let anybody, because if I can get far enough away and if I can hide well enough, then maybe they'll still love me in spite of how broken I am. If I can get far enough away, maybe they won't judge me. Maybe they won't cut me out. Maybe they won't. And ultimately we think if I can hide well enough, then maybe I can get my act together and I can somehow mend this broken part of me. I'm going to tell you what I've discovered. We lived in, a, in an old house in Canton. And in that old house, there was a basement. And there was a, a pretty ungodly amount of mold in that basement. I'm not going to lie to you. There was, it, it's a miracle that I'm alive today. It's, do you know where the mold was the thickest? In the places that were the darkest. Because unhealthy things grow in darkness. Unhealthy things get worse when you hide them. Jesus encounters a man that's walking very carefully with his hand inside of his coat. Because if anybody finds out that his hand is withered, they're going to know he's a leper and he's going to be cast out of society. And he comes to Jesus who is fully capable of healing his leprosy with just a word. But you know what Jesus tells him? He says, stretch out your hand. In other words, bring that darkest, most broken part of yourself out of hiding. And as he extends the withered, leprous hand out of hiding, Scripture says that he was made whole. As long as he hid it, he was still in infirmity. But the moment he brought it out of hiding, the word of God was healing over him. There are some of you that have been living in isolation because you don't want anyone to know about what you're struggling with. You don't want anyone to know what you're facing. And the encouragement to you today is that you are not going to find freedom and victory by yourself. Isolation will not produce freedom. Living in hiding will not produce freedom. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. You know what the context of this verse is? The first two chapters of Genesis, God creates the earth. He creates the sky. He creates the sea. He creates birds, fish, grass, man. He creates all of it. And after every pattern of creation, he rhythmically says, and it was good. And it was good. But for the first time in the narrative of creation, God looks down and says, that ain't good. 
God created every aspect of creation, and when he finished, said it's good. But for the first time in creation narrative, God adds a not in front of his good. Here is the big idea. Mankind living by himself was the first aspect of creation that God could not, could refer to as not good. You weren't created to do this by yourself. And I'm going to tell you what happened when you walked in the room today. I don't care how dirty you feel. I don't care how broken you feel. When you walked in the door today, you inherited a friend group. You inherited a family today. Now, I ain't going to front with you. You got some weirdos. Like, we got, we got some... We got some weird folk. Like, yeah, I ain't telling you we a perfect friend group. I'm just telling you, you got one. You found a safe place to come out of hiding. Now, I feel prompted to say this because of the culture that we live in. When I say safe space, that doesn't mean we're going to affirm your brokenness. That means we're going to say you don't got to stay broken. Because when our culture says a safe place, it means that I'm going to tell you how messed up I am and you're going to tell me that's okay. No, the beauty of the gospel is that when I tell God how messed up I am, he says, that's all right, let me fix it. And then he transforms my life. He changes my life. And so when I tell you it's a safe space, you got a safe space to be in process. But understand, God is going to start a process in you. And he's going to change you. This is a safe space to walk into that healing process. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 2. I tell you this and I'm done. I promise this time. The Bible says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, how, I, Pastor, I just want to know, how can I, how can I be in the will of God? You want to be in the will of God? Get close enough with other believers that you can bear one another's burdens. And in doing so, you will fulfill the law of Christ. You found a place to belong today. If you're a first-time guest, welcome. Welcome to the family. You only get to be a guest one Sunday. Next week, you go on in the fridge, grab you something to drink. Like it's... I want us to bow our heads together. Hey, friends, I hope you were blessed by the message today. Listen, if you've decided to accept Jesus today, I just want to tell you what an amazing decision you've made. It's quite literally the best decision that you could have ever made. And so I want to lead you in a prayer. And listen, there's nothing magical about these words. There's nothing that I'm going to say that is is really spectacular in nature. But if you posture in your heart to where you say, God, I need you and I want you in my life, then this prayer that I'm about to pray can literally change your life. And I believe God is about to move into your situation and change your life for the better. And I believe you're about to secure your eternity in heaven. So would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Father, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is. I believe he's the son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sin. And I'm sorry for the way that I've been living my life, but today I hear you calling me into relationship. So Jesus, would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me? Would you make me new? Would you be the Lord of my life? And I promise that by your grace, I'm gonna live the rest of my life for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, friend, if you just prayed that prayer, can I tell you, it is the best moment of your life. You just secured your eternity in heaven. Now you're on a journey. It doesn't stop there. It's not a prayer you pray and you're done, but now you're on a journey called discipleship as you grow to learn of Jesus and grow to learn more of him. And we would love to be a part of that journey. If you got saved today, would you please send us an email to info at myawaken.org? And in that subject line, just put... I receive Jesus and we would love to follow up with you and tell you what your next steps are in that discipleship process. Thank you again for watching us. We can't wait to see you again right here next week. God bless you. Have a good week.